Um, he is now currently a um, teacher, uh, he's a professor of history at Hillsdale College in Michigan. And uh, many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with that college. Uh, he's also served um, as the, uh, the scholar in residence at the Intercollegiate uh, Institute. Uh, what is it called? Well, you're not there now, so I shouldn't have to worry. Intercollegiate Studies Institute. He was there for a number of years in Delaware. So we're just thankful that you could come spend this time with us, uh, Daryl. So God bless you as you come to speak. Let's greet him. Thanks for that kind introduction, and um, thanks for coming out on this gorgeous day. Uh, if I were better behaved, I wouldn't uh, think that maybe you should get a life uh, <laughs> and spend this day doing something else other than listening to me gas on. Um, but, I, but it is nice to be here, and, and uh, dr the drive down from Seattle yesterday, which turned out to be kind of a cheap cheapest flight and a way to see some friends up there uh, on the way back. Um, it was just a, struck by the gorgeous um, qualities of, of Oregon. This is the farthest south I've been, so it's great to be here. A um, couple of qualifications may be in order as before I begin. One of these is that I am a historian, um, which means uh, that people often get frustrated with me for not talking about the Bible more. Uh, I do believe in the Bible. I think I know a lot about the Bible. Uh, and I guess tomorrow I'll be preaching, although I prefer to call it exhorting, since I'm only an elder um, and not a pastor. Um, but, but my expertise is, is history, and that's informed a lot of my convictions uh, through the years. Um, and so my own understanding of what it means to be Reformed or Reformed Protestant um, comes from history and also from study of scripture and sitting under, under the ministry of the word um, in my life. But anyway, that's one frustration you could have. Another is that um, I say a lot of objectionable things sometimes. Um, and even my wife, whom I've been, to whom I've been married for 30 years, thinks that I say a lot of objectionable things. So if you find things that I say objectionable, don't, feel, don't be surprised um, or feel like you're in the minority. Um, and I guess I like to be provocative. So if, if you are provoked, I guess I've, I've succeeded in some way. Um, but <clears throat> I, I do find that there is, um, the, hi the teaching history is, is a real challenge because oftentimes we think we have an understanding of the past and the heroes of the past. And it turns out that, that their lives and times are a lot more complicated than we thought. And it turns out that their lives are complicated in ways that ours, our lives are complicated as well. So it shouldn't surprise us that the lives of saints are complicated. Um, but so sometimes we, if we hear things from the past, it may challenge or, or, and be bracing in ways that um, are surprising. And oftentimes we look to the past for reassurance, but it can actually be sobering as well. So anyway, the first talk today is about Christian life as a pilgrimage. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about, although this will be a theme throughout the day, uh, Christian life as pilgrimage and our, and our um, need for the church, uh, the ministry of the church in our pilgrimage. Um, but I want to start particularly by, by talking about conversion and questioning the importance of conversion in some ways. So here we go, pr provocation already. Uh, but but, we, but, but I, I think it's really useful, especially for uh, trying to understand um, the means of grace, the ministry of the church, our dependence upon the church, to rethink how we understand conversion or the beginning of the Christian life and how the Christian life proceeds from it. Um, and so I'd like to encourage us to think of Christian life as a pilgrimage, as a journey, um, one of the, uh, if, if you want to think about this more, I watch a lot of movies, uh, having been a film studies student as an undergraduate, and 
There's a wonderful documentary series um, that's still ongoing um, called The Up Series. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it started 7-Up, and, and it started with these um, English school children, seven years old in 1964, and they were, it was designed to show uh, the, the, the divisions in the class structure in English society. And so they, they, they would go back every seven years and look at these, these children. So they become adolescents, then they become young adults, and then adults. And 50, 56 up is, is coming out this year. Um, so they've, they've kept at it. And it's, it's remarkable to see the way these lives have progressed. And it's, there are things that you never would have expected. And I think this is, again, true for all of us, that when we were young, we had dreams or hopes for the future in our lives never turned out to be that way, in some ways much better than we expected, in some ways less so, maybe disappoint, disappointments along the way, and understanding the Christian life in a similar way as a journey with a lot of unexpected twists and turns, lots of joys but also sorrows, I think is a useful way for thinking about the Christian life. And again, our understanding of conversion, the conversion experience, the dramatic turning to, to God in a, in a moment of crisis or in coming down the aisle um, at an altar call uh, is something that may get in the way of our thinking about Christian life as a, as a journey. Um, so one of, one of the, an additional contrast here um, is, uh, is, say, an organic or... Um, and I was struck by the produce across the way from where I'm staying. I, uh, Stan thinks they may be pear trees, and I've never seen so many pear trees like that. It was really gorgeous. Um, but to think of, of Christian life in organic or ag agricultural categories as opposed to mechanical or industrial ones. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, it's amazing how much scripture is filled with ag agrarian uh, examples or metaphors for the Christian life and understanding uh, the work of the church, our own growth in grace, growth itself is, is, is an organic category. But oftentimes, too, when we have this understanding of conversion as an instantaneous kind of spark that, that, that ignites us, we may have more of a industrial or mechanical model of the Christian life. And so if, if we think about the biblical model, say, uh, Matthew 13, the parable of the sower and the, the seeds that take root in different kinds of soil. Or John 6, um, where Christ talks about himself as the bread and, 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 and the, his body and blood being bread and, and, and drink for sustaining life. Um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the seed sown into the ground coming back and, and the body being uh, imperishable, indestructible. So there are all these agrarian or, or organic metaphors throughout scripture that I think are useful for thinking again about the Christian life as a journey or as a process or as a pilgrimage. Um, <clears throat> so that then leads to uh, more concerted attention to conversion and what conversion Means And I want to start then by giving a little historical point, making a little historical point, that um, there is more to Protestantism than evangelicalism. Um, that, that used to be the case, and this is not so much anymore, the mainline Protestants or the so-called liberal Protestants have completely been wiped away. Nobody pays any attention to them anymore. Now, of course, they're there in all of our towns. There's the First Methodist, the First Presbyterian, the, uh, the, the Baptist Church. Oftentimes, many of these are in mainline or, or liberal churches. It used to be the case when I was growing up. Thank you. That'll be helpful. Um, thanks. When, that, that everyone knew what a liberal was and to stay away from those liberal churches. And Billy Graham got in a lot of trouble in 1956 for working with the liberal churches in New York City when he had his 1956 crusade. <clears throat> but th that seems to have gone away. Um, there doesn't seem to be a recognition as much anymore of liberalism. But it used to be that you had two kinds of Protestants. You had either evangelical Protestants or you had liberal Protestants. Um, and that two-party model, I think, is not, has, has been a disservice for another kind of Protestantism, which I like to call confessional Protestantism. I see someone here has 
a book that, that I wrote about this called The Lost Soul of American Protestantism. I'm not trying to make a plug for that, but that's where I do develop this idea of confessional Protestantism as a, another kind of Protestantism, a third kind. My own church, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, would, would fit into this kind of Protestantism. Missouri Synod Lutherans would also be another group that fall into this category. A lot of the Dutch Reformed or Dutch Calvinists uh, in North America would also fit in this confessional model, meaning they're neither evangelical nor liberal. And one of the ways in which that's evident is by thinking about uh, conversion. Uh, and again, whether conversion is essential to the Christian life. Um, so that's another reason for thinking through a, this uh, important matter of conversion and what it means. So in this first lecture then, more specifically now, I want to contrast the two conversion experiences of two important figures in American Protestantism, Jonathan Edwards and uh, John Williamson Nevin. Um, so first a word about Edwards, and, and you can almost argue that, that Edwards is the defining model for evangelicalism uh, in the United States. Jonathan Edwards was born in 1703 and died in 1756, although it may be 58 if, I might, if my memory is off. Um, <clears throat> he was born to a, a, a congregational minister in East Windsor, Connecticut, and w at the time that he died, he was serving as the president of the College of New Jersey, which would later become Princeton University. Um, and so Edwards was, was reared in a Christian home um, and, and exposed to the faith, prayed with his parents, read the, read the Bible, memorized the, the shorter catechism. Um, and yet, when he went off to Yale College as, as a young, um, well, not so young, as an adolescent, people went to college a lot earlier back then, around when they were 14 or so. Once they'd mastered enough Latin and Greek, they could go to college. Um, and so it, it, he went to college. He'd never experienced a conversion, what he called a new sense of things. Um, and then sometime in 1721, spring of 1721, when he was roughly 18, Edwards encountered the truth of the gospel and God in a way that he had never uh, encountered it before. And he had described this experience as having come from reading 1 Timothy 1.17, uh, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, it's a kind of peculiar text in my estimation for having a conversion experience of turning to Christ away from your sin, since the verse doesn't even mention um, Jesus. Uh, but so the, so the puzzles about Nevin's, uh, excuse me, Edward's conversion may begin there. But I think what was key in that verse for Edwards was this, this idea of, of the honor and glory of God. And if you listen much to John Piper, who um, is, a, is a great fan of Edwards, uh, he's, he's, he's adopted this phrase of, um, is it Christian hedonism or something like this? And this is being a hedonistic pursuit of the glory of God. I, I'm not sure that hedonism is the word we should use to describe that. But, but again, I think that's part of what Edwards has going on here. Piper and Edwards both are very much enraptured by uh, the glory of God. Um, Edwards went on to say this, this was the first instance that he remembered <clears throat> of that inward sweet delight in God and divine things. And then he, he went on to say, as I read the words that came into, <clears throat> excuse me, I came into my soul and <clears throat> was, as it were, diffused through it, a sense of the glory of the divine being, a new sense quite different from anything, <clears throat> pardon me, I ever experienced before. Never any words of scripture seemed to me as these words did. I thought with myself how excellent a being that was and how happy I should be if I might enjoy that God and be wrapped up in him in heaven and be, as it were, swallowed up in him forever. From about that time, I began to have a new kind of apprehensions of, uh, and ideas of Christ and the work of redemption and the glorious way of salvation by him. An inward sweet sense of these things at times came into my heart, and my soul was led away in pleasant views and contemplations of them. 
the, the, the phrases that are quite striking about this, this description of Edward's conversions, his own description, is that he was wrapped up in God, in heaven, and he was swallowed up in him as if forever. So this idea of almost being merged with God, of, 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 of uh, a direct encounter with God, to the point of almost losing yourself in God, um, is, is, is a striking feature of Edward's conversion. And um, it, it's, it's, a f- it's a way of viewing conversion also that was more typical of the time, even among people who weren't Calvinist, as Edwards was. Many of you likely do not know, and there's no reason why you should, know the name Henry Alline, who was the George Whitfield of Canada. And he was a contemporary of Edwards, and he led a, a lot of revivals in Maine and, and, and the eastern provinces of Canada, he was a free will Baptist, so he was not a Calvinist. And he just had a, he also didn't go to college, so he wasn't nearly as learned as, Ed, as Edwards was. And this is how he described his own conversion experience. Oh, the infinite condescension of God to a worm of the dust. For though my whole soul was filled with love and ravished with divine ecstasy beyond any doubts or fears or thoughts of being deceived, for I enjoyed a heaven on earth and it seemed as if I were wrapped up in God. So again, there's this sense in this conversion experience, at least in the 18th century sense, of being having this direct encounter with God and being wrapped up in Him and losing one's uh, sense of oneself in a way. So this becomes the centerpiece of um, true Christianity for those who follow in the revivalist, evangelical, born again experience. And what's also striking about this is that this experience. Of, um, of divine grace in, in conversion leads to an earnest Christian life devoted to holiness. Um, and it, this, this Christian devotion is, is uh, or the conversion experience is like powder milk biscuits, if you've heard Garrison Keillor go on about this, that give the spiritually shy the strength to get up and glorify God. Um, and what's also striking about Edward's own experience and this description of his, his, um, his conversion is that he went on to resolve about, oh, maybe 50-some resolutions that he, that he committed his life to after this because of this redirection, this complete change in his life. And I'll just read a couple of these resolutions, which, again, is very typical of an evangelical kind of piety that, that's based on this conversion experience. Um, he, Edwards wrote, resolve that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to God's glory and my own good, profit and pleasure in the whole of my duration without any consideration of the time, whether now or never so many myriads of ages hence, resolve to do whatever I think to be my duty and most for the good and advantage of mankind in general, resolve to do this whatever difficulties I meet with how many and how great soever. That's only one resolution. I don't know where you, how you have 49 more. That's enough right there for a, for a lifetime. But then he goes on. Resolve to be continually endeavoring to find out some new invention or contrivance to promote the, f- the forementioned things. So there's, there's a life of earnestness that follows from this conversion experience. And, and Edwards was not unusual in thinking about this. What made Edwards unusual was that he wrote about it and wrote about it as powerfully as he did. And he was an important leader in the first great awakening, the, the, the revivals that we associate with George Whitfield in the 1730s and 1740s. And Edwards would go on to train a number of pastors Back at that, at, in the day, uh, in, the, in, the, in this 18th century, you didn't go to seminary to become a pastor. What you did was you moved in with an experienced pastor, and you became a pred- an apprentice in that congregation. And oftentimes, if the pastor had an attractive daughter, you'd marry the daughter as well. <laughs> and that's what happened to some of the, the, the men who pr- apprenticed with, um, with Edwards, that they married his, his, some of his children. He had about 10, I believe. And, and so... Edwards ministered in a town, uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, and I suppose most of you are not familiar with East Coast geography. There's no reason why you should be, because we in the East Coast aren't familiar with West Coast geography. Um, but, but this is on the Connecticut River in, that runs through Connecticut and Massachusetts, 
And the Connecticut River Valley was where many of these Edwardsian ministers with the, some of the, the, the daughters of Jonathan Edwards would minister. So the, it, there, there was this whole Edwardsian strain of, of evangelicalism, sometimes called the New Divinity, that became uh, centered in this Connecticut River Valley. And so this, this was not just Edwards' own experience, but he would go on to influence many pastors who would continue to promote this kind of experience. And then Edwards himself wrote about it uh, in his own memoirs and in his own also writings about the First Great Awakening and trying to defend it. Um, <clears throat> for instance, uh, in the 1735, um, he started to preach a series of sermons on justification by faith alone which led the youth in the congregation to begin to put aside some of their youthful things and, and turn themselves more seriously to things of God. And this is how, and, and Edwards began to write about it, and these writings about the, these revivals in 1735 uh, became published and, and, and widely circulated on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean among English-speaking Protestants. And this became sort of a model then for revivalism of the, of the First Great Awakening. It's four years later than the George Whitfield, the greatest evangelist of, this, of the 18th century, comes to North America and begins to promote revivals on a bigger scale. But so Edwards is at the, at the forefront of, this, of this, these revivals of the First Great Awakening. And this is how he writes about some of these revivals. There are many that have lately been converted, who have been accounted very knowing persons, especially in the things of religion, and could talk with more than common understanding of conversion that declare that all their former wisdom is brought to naught, and that they appear to themselves to have been mere babes. The converting influences of God's spirit very commonly bring an extraordinary conviction of the reality and certainty of the great things of religion. They have that sight and taste of the divinity and divine excellency of the things of the gospel that is more to convince them than the readings of hundreds of volumes of arguments without it. What he's trying to say in this quotation is that there were many people in the church who became converted, who had grown up in the church, and who knew, had all sorts of what he might call head knowledge of the things of God and, and scripture, and yet they'd never had this experience. And then once they had this experience, all this former knowledge was counted for naught, as if they, had, they didn't need it in a way. Um, and, and they had a, this new kind of experience and awakening and quickening of the spirit. And again, this is how powerful the conversion experience is, that it makes your for former self, even if you have a lot of knowledge of religion, makes it seem expendable because this experience is so transforming. Uh, and, he, and he talks about some of the converts in this. He talks about an older woman who was, uh, he described as modest, bashful, and pious. Interesting that he would call her pious. I, I don't know why you would want to convert someone who's pious. It seems to me you'd want them to continue to be pious and not change. What does, conversion does mean change, uh, moving away from one direction and moving to another. Um, and this is going to be a problem with the conversion model, it seems to me. But still, she was modest, bashful, and pious. These are all traits that I think most ministers and elders in churches would love to see in their congregants. Um, and yet, she wanted to have this conversion experience and the conversion experience then, I mean, I don't know what it's like on the West Coast. It's not this way in the East Coast or in, in the Midwest now. But where people would actually feel like they were about to die. And so she wanted it so much. And she, it, was, it was like a nervous breakdown this woman had. And this is true of many other people. And there were shakes and jitters that sometimes accompanied these things. It's really kind of bizarre. Um, so bizarre that one of the examples that Edwards writes about, and we, we, we teach about it at Hillsdale College, I'm still not sure why it's in one of our collections of, of readings for the American Heritage course, but this little girl called Phoebe Bartlett, a four-year-old who also wanted to be converted, and she's shaking and wailing, and, and um, it, anyone who has a, a paternal or maternal sense would, I think, want to keep their child from, from this. So there's some really strange... Um, examples of conversions here that Edwards is writing about, but again, they become very powerful and influential and become a model of the entry point into this full encounter with God's experience. And so these people have this dramatic turning from despair of how can I ever 
know God or how can I ever be right with God, whatever it is, to then to this ecstasy of joy and, and being wrapped up in God and having the assurance of God's love and favor. Um, so Edwards wrote both in describing these conversions, describing his own conversion, then he wrote a very important book called Religious Affections in 19, excuse me, 1742, where he tried to defend this idea of conversion and how important it was to the Christian life. Um, and, and the point I'm trying to make here about Edwards is, again, that it's possible to think very carefully and systematically even the way Edwards does about conversion. It's, it's possible not only to experience this, but also to write about it and then to make this a model for how people become Christians. What is the entry point or the start of the Christian life? Um, and, and part of what, uh, what I'm hoping to make the point as well is that this wasn't the way that Protestants thought about conversion before. Edwards is introducing a new way of thinking about conversion, a new way of thinking about how we enter into the Christian life. And it's, it's striking how many historians also have noticed how this kind of um, uh, experiential Calvinism, it's sometimes called, or pra uh, practical divinity is another phrase sometimes attributed to it, how different it is from the original reformers, from the reformation of Calvin and Luther and Zwingli. Um, and, and so Puritanism, at least as, as Edwards understood it, or his kind of evangelicalism, may actually be in some ways a departure from the original Protestant movement. Um, and Edwards may, in fact, be pointing much more to Billy Graham than he is pointing back to John Calvin and Martin Luther. And if you want a quick little historical explanation for why that may be the case, um, I've recently been writing on the history of Calvinism. And in the late 16th century, the Puritans uh, were frustrated with their ability to, to reform the Church of England. They wanted to continue to reform the church, but the monarch at the time, Queen Elizabeth, who was the head of the Church of England, thanks, that's the way the English Reformation played out, didn't want to go as far as the Puritans wanted to go. So the Puritans, instead then of trying to reform the church, they tried to reform individuals. And the reform movement turned from reforming the church and its liturgical or worship life and its creeds and its mode of government to reforming personal lives. And there's this rise and proliferation of literature, many of it still published by places like Banner of Truth Trust, that talks about how Christians can be holy, how they can reform their own lives. So there's a turning away from the, the, the corporate church in the, in the late 16th century to the individual life. And, and that's part of the reason why I think there's this change and shift in the way that people understand the uh, Christian experience or the conversion experience. So, um, but still, the, the, the larger point here, as far as spending so much time on Edwards, is that he is this great exponent of revivalism and a kind of conversion experience that he himself experienced. And again, it may be that the case that it's a departure or a shift from an older understanding of conversion, the one that the uh, Protestants originally had in the 16th century. Um, so for a different perspective on conversion, uh, I want to turn then next to John Williamson Nevin. Uh, he is someone that um, many uh, contemporary Protestants do not know much about, and there's not necessarily a reason why you should, except that he's, he's a kind of interesting figure. He, w he lived from 1803 to 1886, um, and what, what, what's striking is he's born a century after Jonathan Edwards, and so that whenever there's going to be a celebration of Edwards' life, which happens in, on, you know, every 100 or 50 years, depending on the anniversary, uh, Nevin's anniversary is also there, and he'll always be overshadowed by Edwards throughout eternity until the Lord returns. Um, kind of uh, the way Nevin, uh, Edwards gets the last word over, over uh, Nevin, even though 
Nevin live later. He grew up, Nevin grew up in a Presbyterian home in, in Pennsylvania um, at, near um, Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. His family was Scotch-Irish in background. Most of the early Presbyterians in, in the United States were from either Scottish or Scotch-Irish descent. He uh, went to college in, uh, at Union College in Schenectady, New York, and after uh, studying at, at Union, he went to Princeton Seminary in order to study to become a minister. So if he goes to Princeton, that means good things, right? That means he has the stamp of approval. And to make that stamp of approval even stronger, when Charles Hodge, Charles Hodge, you may not know, but if you don't know, was probably the greatest Presbyterian theologian of the 19th century, taught at Princeton Seminary for almost 50 years, taught more seminary students than any other seminary professor in the 19th century. Um, still, Hodge's systematic theology is still in print, still a very useful work. When Hodge, though, who was teaching at Princeton in the 1820s, he went on to Germany to study in Germany for a couple years to improve his, his uh, biblical languages and also to think through some theological matters. When Hodge left for two years, Nevin filled in for Hodge to teach at Princeton Seminary. So Nevin's not only a Princeton graduate, thumbs up, but then also taught at Princeton's faculty, double thumbs up. This is the 200th anniversary, by the way, of Princeton Seminary. It was founded in 1812, and there have been many conferences devoted to um, the bicentennial of Princeton. Princeton really is an important institution in North America for Reformed Protestantism. So Nevin has Princeton's seal of approval. He goes on after teaching at Princeton to teach at a place called Western Seminary. Now, out here in Oregon, you might think that Western Seminary would be somewhere in Oregon or Washington, uh, well, or even Colorado. Um, but this was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That was as far west <laughs> as things were back then. Um, so he was teaching at, at uh, Presbyterian ministers or prospective Presbyterian ministers on the Pittsburgh frontier. And he taught at, Prince, at Pittsburgh Seminary or Western Seminary for 10 years. And then he made this curious switch. This is a man, Scotch-Irish in background. Speaks fluent English, as most Scotch-Irish did. <coughs> he then, in 1840, joins the German Reformed Church and teaches at their seminary in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania, which is very close to his hometown, um, and has a very important... Uh, position there at Mercersburg and becomes associated with something called the Mercersburg theology, which is uh, has lots of problems associated with it. It's even hard to, under, to define what the Mercersburg theology was, so I don't want to get into all that, except to say that there are questions surrounding Nevin, and I'm not going to recommend Nevin as always the most reliable guide to the Christian faith. But, but it is a curious switch to go from this English-speaking communion to one that was in st some, certain sectors of the German Reformed Church were still German-speaking. Um, and, and in our history of, uh, of Calvinism, we don't usually think of German Calvinists. We think of Dutch Calvinists. There probably are some even in this part of Oregon, I would imagine. Um, certainly up in Washington State. Um, then... We also think of, obviously, the, Scotch, the Scots or the Scotch-Irish with the Presbyterian tradition. We think of Switzerland, of course, where Zwingli and Calvin ministered. So we think of the Swiss. And we even think of the Puritans, the English contribution to Calvinism. We don't generally think of the German Reformed or the German Calvinists. But they are an important um, uh, group of Calvinists coming out of the 16th century. And they've given us one of the greatest... Um, uh, teaching devices of, of the Reformation, the Heidelberg Catechism. That was written in the city of Heidelberg in Germany, originally in German. Um, so, so German Reformed Church is not necessarily just some bystander in American Protestantism. Nevin switches from the Presbyterians to the German Reformed to teach at their seminary and also teaches at their, their college eventually, Franklin and Marshall College, which is today is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, but What's curious, to get back to the theme of conversion, um, Nevin 
goes to Union College in, in, in New York. Again, he's about 14 or 15, which was the typical age that adolescents then went to college. Uh, and I'm sure some parents today might think that would be a good age for certain members of the family to, to vacate the house. Um, <clears throat> and he, he, when he was 67, <clears throat> he wrote about his experience <clears throat> at Union. And there was, a, there was a revival that came through, uh, came through the college in about 1821 or 1820. And, um, and, and Nevin just, uh, he tried to have a conversion experience. He wanted to have a conversion experience. He had a kind of conversion experience, but it just didn't measure up to the kind of conversion experience that um, Edwards had had. Um, so Nevin, writing about his experience, says, being of what is called Scotch-Irish extraction, uh, I was a conscientious and exemplary professor of religion. So he had grown up in the Presbyterian tradition. His parents had catechized him. He'd gone to church twice on Sunday. He was thoroughly acquainted with Presbyterianism or Calvinism. Um, but he hadn't yet made a profession of faith when he went off to college. So he says, I had come to college a boy of strongly pious dispositions and exemplary religious habits, never doubting but that I was in some way a Christian, though it had not yet come with me to what is called a public profession of religion. But now one of my first lessons inculcated on me by this system of revivalism, or he called it an unchurchly system, was that all this must pass for nothing and that I must learn to look upon myself as an outcast from the family and kingdom of God. Nevin recalls remembering having to withstand the shock when a revival came through and he had to undergo anxious meetings and torturous counsel, finally trying to convert in some feeble way, but never, and, and so sort of over, overcoming some of his anxieties and doubts. But he thought that this really was an inferior way of entering into full communion in the church, of entering into full membership of the church and being able to partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, so, because he was aware of how much revivalism emphasized the subjective aspects of Christianity. How am I experiencing this? How am I feeling? How am I doing? As opposed to the obje objectivity of Christianity, which is looking to Christ and looking what he has done, looking what God has done on behalf of sinners. So Nevin is very aware of this, this very striking difference between the conversion experience that, that he was expected to have at college, the kind of conversion that, that Nevin had much more fully in the 18th century, and Nevin goes on to then see that this kind of conversion is different from what was uh, typical in the 16th century. And if you look, for instance, in lives, in, auto, in biography of John, of John Calvin, the great reformer of Geneva, uh, there's somewhere 1533, 1534, where Calvin moves from being a Roman Catholic to a Protestant. But he doesn't really talk about a religious a conversion experience. It just happens. I mean, he has a quickening of interest in the things of the gospel, and he writes about um, this switch in his life he, in, the, in his preface to his commentary on the Psalms, but, but com biographers and historians wouldn't call it a conversion experience. And when you look for a conversion experience in Luther's case, you also don't find the kind of conversion that you see Edwards talking about or that you see Edwards encouraging of the people in his congregation. Um, and, and Nevin begins later in his life to see the discrepancy between this conversion experience that Edwards was talking about and his own, but also between what's happening in the revivals of the 19th century led by Charles Finney and the kind of uh, understanding of the Christian life that the reformers talked about in the 16th century. And just to um, <clears throat> make you aware of that, I understand here you use the three forms of unity at this congregation, which includes the Heidelberg Catechism. And if you look in the Heidelberg Catechism for what it teaches about conversion, you'll see the word conversion. You look at other, other Reformed confessions of the 16th century, you won't even see the word conversion mentioned. Um, <clears throat> so conversion wasn't much on, on the Reformers' minds. But, but 
um, it is mentioned in, in the Heidelberg Catechism, and it's in questions 88, 89, and 90. Eight, question 88 asks, what is involved in genuine repentance or conversion? Two things, the dying away of the old self and the coming to the life of the new. Question 89, what is the dying away of the old self? It is to be genuinely sorry for sin, to hate it more and more, and to run away from it. Question 90, what is the coming to life of the new self? It is wholehearted joy in God through Christ and a delight to do every kind of good. In other words, conversion for the Heidelberg Catechism in the 16th century Protestants was sanctification. It was a lifelong process of dying to sin and living to Christ. That's how what people thought of as conversion. It was a lifelong process, not a momentary experience or a dramatic switch. Um, and, and Nevin, who, who began to study much more of the Reformed tradition, becomes very much aware of this. So what we have here then, I think, in the examples of Nevin and Edwards are two models for how we enter the Christian life, or two models, right, of how we enter the Christian life. I won't say of conversion, because I think Nevin was seriously questioning conversion as a model for all Christians. It's clearly adults who convert from a life of never having sat under the Christian ministry, or from a life of, of um, all sorts of sin, they convert. Um, and I don't want to in any way suggest that that isn't a good way for people who have never known Christ to go. But the, pre the problem becomes what happens to children, children who grow up in the faith? Do we expect them to have a conversion experience or not, the way, the way Nevin and Edwards both had them? Uh, Evans much more, uh, Edwards much more fully and, and, and Nevin much more, more feebly. So there, there are two models here. There's the one, the road to D Damascus model, we might call it, the experience of Paul, where Christ appears to him and he has this sudden change of the course of his life. Um, and growing up in a fundamentalist home in church, this was the model conversion that we often hear people give testimonies about. And I myself, growing up in that church, going to church every Sunday, yeah, I goofed off and did some bad things, but I was a pretty good kid. And I'm thinking, well, how can I ever match this kind of conversion experience? I can't do that. And unless, you know, you, m mom and dad want me to go out and sell drugs and, and sleep around with other women. And then, then, ha then I can tell a dramatic story of my conversion. But if, if it's only, you know, well, I went to Sunday school and I went to church and I prayed with my parents and then I became a Christian. That's not all that compelling to tell people. Um, so it's that road to Damascus model that, that I think we can associate with, with Edwards, and it's, it's legitimate, although if you want to talk about Christ appearing to you in your conversion, I think you may want to talk to the pastor and elders in your congregation, because I'm not, not sure that Christ appears to us like that anymore, and you may need some counsel. Um, <laughs> the other model, though, is the, what we might call the Isaac model. This is, again, for children. The, the Isaac model is that of a child who, who grows up never having known otherwise than that he or she was a child of God, which is, was the experience of Isaac in the Old Testament. So the child who grows up always knowing, in some sense, God's love, always being encouraged in the faith, um, and, and being encouraged eventually to make a profession of faith and not having to go undergo some kind of dramatic change. Because again, why would you want to undergo a dramatic change when you've already grown up a pious child? You want to, to, um, to embrace that and understand it and appropriate it much more fully um, th rather than somehow have a dramatic change of life. You don't want to change from what from those patterns that have been established. Um, and you see this, this understanding of conversion of the Isaac model um, more clearly um, from something that the German Reformed Church recommended to its young people as they were about to take their first communion. So in the, in the experience of the German Reformed Christians, or Protestants, uh, children would be baptized as infants. I, 
don't know if you baptize infants here, and pa- pardon me if I step on anyone's toes if you, if you don't. Um, but they would be baptized as infants, um, and then they would be catechized, and they would have to go through a confirmation class and before they could then take the, their first Lord's Supper and then enter into the full communion of the church. <clears throat> and so the German Reformed Church from 1902 has this advice to young people. <clears throat> we require a high degree of fitness for confirmation, namely an intelligent, sincere, and unreserved taking of three most searching and far-reaching vows in the name of the Holy Trinity. Then, too, this fitness for confirmation may be called a change of heart, though this is only another name for conversion. This change is not sudden, but runs through years. You have not had any... (laughs) This is just amazing to me. You have not had any wonderful religious experiences, such as you hear about in others. But the Holy Ghost has done much in you in a very quiet way. Nor need you doubt your conversion, your change of heart, because you cannot tell the day when it took place, as many profess to do. It did not take place in a day, or you might tell it. It is the growth of years, and therefore all the more reliable. And this is an interesting point. You cannot tell when you learn to walk, talk, think, and work. You do not know when you learn to love your earthly father, much less your heavenly father. This is the reformed doctrine of getting religion. We get religion not in bulk, but little by little. Just as we get natural life and strength, so spiritual life and strength day by day. Um, And this is is pretty powerful, especially when we think about this idea of when we learn to love our earthly father. Now, some of us may not love our earthly fathers, um, and and I understand that, and you always have those qualifications before the Father's Day sermons or the Mother's Day sermons. Because there are some people who have difficult relationships with their parents. That's part of being in a family. But if you did love your earthly father, as I did mine, um, I'm not sure. You know, I I really couldn't put a day on when I came to love my dad. Uh, But there was a time when he went from being this this disciplinarian in a home to being somebody whom I really trusted. Um, and, And there wasn't a day. I didn't have, I wasn't wrapped up in the ecstasy of the glory of my father. Um, I, I, he just became much more reliable and trustworthy and lovable, um, even though he still had the same high standards for me. Um, so, and, and I think this is what Nevin is, was, was sensing and, and what the German Reformed Church is advocating. And again, it's just for children. It's not for adults. There are people who need to convert. They need to put away their old lives and a- adopt a new way of life. And there's that, but that cannot become the model for all of God's people, especially for children in our homes, that we want to grow up in the faith and inherit the faith of their parents and grandparents and beyond. So this is the this Isaac model, it seems to me, is the basis for at least challenging the dominance of the conversion model or the road to Damascus model. And I think it also, though, is is very important for trying to think about. Um, a churchly kind of piety, which is what I want to talk about in, in future uh, lectures today. But this churchly piety is one that revolves around the ministry of the church. And if we think of this, this, this Isaac model as our entrance into the faith and our, as our way of growing in grace, our way of thinking about our Christian journey or pilgrimage, uh, we, we be, may begin to have a much better understanding of the church and the importance of the church and our, even our dependence upon the church and its ministry for our Christian lives. So, you know, just outline this very briefly, this churchly piety. It begins with baptism. It, 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 it goes on with catechesis of children. It's geared around the rhythm of the week, especially what happens on Sunday with, with worship and resting from our uh, weekly activities. Um, and, but it's also, the, the Sabbath day is structured around word and sacrament, the preaching of the word and the administration of, of the sacraments. And it, and it extends, this churchly piety extends through our week as well. It's not just something reserved for Sundays, but we, in our vocations, in our secular calling, so-called, we, we try to serve God and honor him in those. And then also in our, in our 
family life, we try to have family worship and other kinds of, uh, of prayer and Bible reading that would also sustain us. But, but the, what happens on the Lord's Day, what happens with God's saints in worship is sort of the, the linchpin of, of, of the week. And everything is based, is, is, is oriented around what happens on Sunday. So, uh, and this becomes a way then of sustaining us in our, in our pilgrimage and helping us grow in faith and having the kind of experience of Isaac where at least those who grow up in the faith never know otherwise and that they are children of God. So, um, we are at 10, a little after 10 o'clock. So, I'm, go I'm going to stop there with the first lecture um, and... There is going to be a time for questions and answers. So um, I should have said that if there's anything really pressing, you could always raise your hand. Uh, but it, it better be good, because there'd be a lot of people look, <laughs> looking at you. Um, so I'll stop here. We'll, we'll take a five-minute break just to kind of stretch and maybe do some other things. And, uh, and then we'll resume in, a, in five minutes.